In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we continue today our uh, Easter week readings, and our, our theme uh, so far that we've seen is that uh, our Lord has appeared to the uh, apostles, the disciples, and has given them instructions. He has explained to them the scriptures, the prophets, Moses, the Psalms, and so on, and they are to uh, await his instructions uh, before preaching uh, to the world. Uh, starting with Jerusalem and then to the Gentiles. And in the, the two epistles from the previous days, uh, Peter is speaking to the household of Cornelius, the centurion, and then Paul speaking to the, um, the Jewish synagogue and then the Gentiles in Antioch. Uh, so we see our, our, our themes are uh, instruction from the Lord and then preaching uh, to the Jews and the Gentiles, receiving that instruction and then passing it along. All are to be saved. And uh, we'll begin today with the, uh, the epistle which is uh, Peter's uh, first address to, we could say, uh, in, in a synagogue after a Pentecost. So the epistles today is from Acts chapter 3, and that follows Acts 2, in which is recounted uh, the story of Pentecost, the um, conversion of the 5,000, the rushing wind, uh, the apostles speaking in tongues, and so on. And so here in Acts 3, uh, Peter heals uh, a cripple and uh, then preaches in the temple to uh, the assembled crowd. And uh, what does he preach? Uh, we're we're going to see the, the um, epistle today and the gospel are, are quite tied together. Uh, but Peter uh, preaches to the Jews a hard truth. He preaches to them that you killed the Messiah. Uh, he begins, you Israelites. Um, and a, a, a little bit of um, uh, stories like they, they gathered around, he healed the crippled man. Uh, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power we have made this man walk? And now we begin uh, the epistle for today. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant. Okay, that's good that God is glorifying his servant. Yes, we got it. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, yes, our forefathers. Who is this servant that God has glorified? Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate. Uh-oh, whoops, that, that was God's servant? Yes, and Pilate, even though he was a Gentile, uh, reckoned him that he ought to be released. But you rejected the Holy Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life. A little bit of poet poetic um, irony there. So this is a hard message. And, and Peter is, um, it's uh, Peter and John were going to the temple. And it's it's Peter and then the whole crowd of Jews. And he's speaking to them as as though, and we must presume there, there were at least a large number, uh, of the very same ones who had been there on Good Friday, whom uh, the Pharisees had incited to ask for the crucifixion of Christ. And here he is preaching to them, he and John, and that's it. You rejected the Holy Righteous One. You asked to have a murderer given unto you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And we continue, friends, uh, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your princes. In this way, God has fulfilled what he foretold through the prophet, that the Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, that your sins may be blotted out. Uh, hard message of Peter that he's preaching. Uh, very direct, uh, very uh, concise, um, very complete, and, and ending with, here is your sin, here, here is your wickedness, um, you have offended God, you have offended man, uh, repent and be saved. That's the message, right? Just as, as he'd gotten from chapter Luke chapter 24 very simple very direct Christ says uh, preach this and Peter says okay you got it and that's what he does right? docility uh, when God asks us to do something we do it when he asks us to believe something we believe it so let's move on to the gospel today we're going to see how these two readings are connected uh, so the gospel uh, gospel of today John 21 uh, after Jesus showed himself to disciples he showed himself again in this manner, and it is describing how uh, St. Peter, uh, with a few of the other apostles, obeying the instructions of Christ, who says, uh, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Uh, this is, again, that's Luke 24 from yesterday. So wait, you know, wait until you've been clothed with power. Okay, we haven't been clothed with power yet. Uh, Peter shows, again, his um, um, uh, character, his, his temperament in that while he's waiting, he's not going to be idle. He's going to do something. Well, I don't know what to do. Uh, when you don't know what to do, do what you know. And he knows how to fish. 
so he goes out fishing. And um, this whole section here, this whole John chapter 21, um, it is a fulfillment of the prophet Ezekiel. Um, and if we could, we could go there quickly, this is Ezekiel chapter 47. And um, well, just in today's gospel, if you haven't read it yet, which you should be, be doing these readings every day before listening to these sermons, um, read the whole chapter. Uh, it, it, it's St. Peter and the apostles go fishing in the Sea of Galilee, and, and, and they're pulling out the draft of fish, and it's 153, and they go on shore with our Lord, and, and, and so on. So that, that's the story that we're, we're um, uh, in today's gospel. And it's fulfilling Ezekiel 47, which is about water flowing from the temple. Right After the Messiah comes, at when God restores Jerusalem, uh, Ezekiel has a vision um, that he, he brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and there water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east, and water was flowing down to the south, and water was flowing out of the temple. There's as much imagery in the Old Testament about uh, uh, this water flowing from the temple, and we know that to be uh, the temple of Christ's body, the blood and water that flowed forth from his heart, uh, pierced with that lance from the soldier, St. Longinus, and um, representing baptism, representing cleansing, representing the sacraments. And uh, what about it? What about this water flowing from the temple uh, in Ezekiel chapter 47? We go to verse, uh, verses 8, 7, 8, 9. Um, he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down to the Arabah. And when it enters the sea of stagnant waters, the water will become fresh, right? The sea of this world, as we'll see. Wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. There will be very many fish once the waters reach there. It will become fresh and everything will live where the river goes. Men will stand fishing beside the sea uh, and it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of a great many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. Oh, uh, so that is a prophecy being fulfilled right now as we read. John chapter 21. Uh, so once again, the prophets being fulfilled as Christ said in Luke chapter 24. So the uh, apostles are out there on the sea fishing. And uh, inter uh, so again, we, we pay attention to little details. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. That night, right? Uh, night, as opposed to uh, lightness, the daytime which was represented by Christ. Anytime there's their night or darkness, it's going to symbolize either um, a life without Christ, a life without grace, or a lack of understanding, or uh, working in a human manner instead of a supernatural man manner, uh, anything like that. So what we want to understand is that, uh, and, and night is the time to fish, right? The apostles were fishermen. They knew when to fish. They knew when the right time was. But these little details are going to be included for a, a spiritual reason. So that night they caught nothing. Why? Because they hadn't been clothed with power from above yet. Um, they are fishers of men now. And, and so this is symbolizing that that night, without Christ, without the, the supernatural help of the Holy Ghost, you're not going to catch anything. You can fish for souls as much as you want. Without uh, me, you can do nothing, as Jesus said. So just after daybreak, right after the resurrection, uh, Jesus stood on the beach, solid ground. Uh, the fathers of the church say that the sea, the ocean, uh, represents the, the uh, turbulent waters of life, the ever-changing conditions of this world, and the beach represents heaven, uh, stability, uh, no, no more change, no more evil, no more um, whatever. It, it, it's the, um, the stability of truth, of eternal life. So this is where Jesus stands now uh, in heaven, and he calls to the disciples, right, from heaven to them on earth. and uh, Children, have you, no, have you any fish? Uh, no. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Uh, so those who are in this world, in, in the, um, the apostles, need to listen to the voice of Christ speaking to them from heaven, right? uh, giving them heavenly instruction. It's not what we know in this life, our expertise in this world, but listening to the church, listening to the supernatural wisdom of God. That is what is going to enable us to catch fish in this life, to catch souls. Um, you can listen to all the experts you want, listen to all the lawyers, listen to uh, the, the um, advisors, all the people, oh, no, you don't want to do this. You want to do it this way. Uh, this is what's going to get people. This is what people are listening to these days. You need to change this and change that. Baloney. Listen to the church. Listen to the fathers. Listen to the councils of old. That is, is the wisdom of the Holy Ghost speaking in the church. That's what's going to convert people. That's what's going to bring people uh, salvation. It's not, none of this, this new... Um, experts stuff 
problem today is that lawyers are running the church. Um, no. Back to our gospel. Um, cast into the right side of the boat. Uh, so they cast it, and they, now they were not able to haul in because there were so many fish. And the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Peter heard it was the Lord, uh, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. And the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish. Uh, okay, and, and the number of fish, as it's going to say later in the, in, the, in the gospel here, is 153. And so the um, significance of that is, is that after, um, by listening to Christ, by observing the heavenly instruction that is given, um, all mankind can be saved. Right, here we go with that, that theme today that people love to talk about. 153 was the number of uh, species of fish in the ancient world. It was like, okay, there are 153 species of fish, and, and that's it. So all the, all the fish in the world, every kind of fish, rich, poor, young, old, good, bad, uh, whatever it may be, everyone, every nation can be saved by Christ. And the net is not broken, the net representing the Holy Mother Church, not torn by schism. Uh, so the, the, the Holy Roman Catholic Church is sufficient for the whole world to find salvation. There's no person, no circumstance, no nation, no culture that cannot find uh, uh, both salvation, but also thrive in the Catholic Church. There doesn't need to be a multiplicity of religions. There needs to be one religion, one net, unbroken, that will save all mankind. And that is signified by that. Um, you know, there is also a, um, you know, there's so much is contained in scripture, but then there's also other significations that can, that we can recognize later, uh, you know, pious, um, I don't want to say additions, but, but just thing, signification you can find. And so one of those is that the 153 fish, uh, can also th th represent there are 153 Hail Marys in, uh, uh the full rosary, right? 15 decades. Um, and you know, this isn't going to be primary, is, is that the, the structure of the rosary didn't come along until much, much later. Uh, that's not a primary signification. But we can look at that and say, sure, through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, uh, that's how we're going to save souls, is, is by recitation of the rosary, by going to her, trusting in her intercession as, as co-redemptrix. Uh, we're, we're going to save souls uh, by listening to Christ first, even as she does, uh, but then praying to her for her intercession. That, that's going to be the, um, the one-two combo, we could say. So another good... Um, a way of reading scripture is, is looking for such uh, um, um, uh, parallels, significations. Now we continue with um, a, a rather painful moment for St. Peter in today's gospel, which is when he goes ashore, he, he jumps out of the boat and swims ashore, and when he comes ashore, what did he see? He saw Christ, yes, uh, but he also saw uh, what it says the other apostles saw, a uh, charcoal fire there, charcoal fire. A uh, very painful memory for St. Peter, recalling uh, what happened in the courtyard of the high priest, where he had denied our Lord three times while he was standing by a charcoal fire warming himself. And that is John uh, chapter 18, verse 18. Uh, so we're about to come, come to the um, uh, St. Peter making reparation for that threefold denial of Christ. Right? Peter uh, loved Christ, but he was also weak. He still loved himself. He still loved the world. And that had to be purified. And it's not included in today's gospel. Uh, but the continuation after, after today's uh, selection ends is uh, Christ asking Peter that three times, uh, Simon Peter, do you love me? Right? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? He asked him three times. And, and Peter was hurt that Christ asked him a third time, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. And... Um, and so th th this is that moment uh, when, when that began, when St. Peter uh, is faced with face to face with the very man that he had denied. And, and this is perhaps is the first time that Peter has really uh, is the moment, right? It's the moment of forgiveness, that moment of truth where Peter has to accept about himself the hard, hard reality of his own weakness and of his own betrayal of Christ. Uh, and that's what gives St. Peter his boldness in speaking, uh, in preaching the, the forgiveness of Christ because he himself had received it, right? This is the tie to today's epistle where St. Peter's in the synagogue and he tells the Jews, you crucified the Christ, you killed the author of life. But he's able to do that. He's not afraid of saying that. He's not, he, because he knows, look, it happened to me. I know you did it in ignorance, just like I betrayed our Lord out of weakness. It happens to all of us. We're all sinners. We all need forgiveness and repentance. 
That's why I'm telling it to you. It hurt me. Uh, you know, I suffered from that. I had to face our Lord and admit my guilt, but he forgave me. He forgave me for that, and he can forgive you too. He wants to forgive you. So now I'm telling you, repent of your sins and be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, pick up your beds and walk. Stop laying down uh, uh, in, in the Old Testament, in, in the scriptures that are being fulfilled as you speak. Get up and walk. Walk through the world. Preach to people. Bring them to salvation. That's what we're here for. Let's do it. Right? This is the message of St. Peter, but it, it's founded uh, on honesty. It's founded on humility. It's founded on the ability to admit my faults, my failings. I have betrayed Christ. What are my problems? This is why humility is the, is the foundation of the spiritual life. If, if you're not humble, you don't know who you are. And, and you, you cannot preach the gospel effectively to other people as you're either you're afraid of offending them or you're, you're, you're don't, are afraid of perhaps of being a hypocrite. Uh, you, you just don't know the truth because you haven't seen it yourself. You haven't accepted it. Uh, and, and so th this is why it's so important. And, and, and you know, these days we hear um, a, a lack of that boldness of St. Peter. We don't hear that message because there is a reluctance in the church to talk about sin, to talk about judgment, to talk about uh, the reality of, you know, yes, we do offend Christ. And, and sin is real, and there are things which need to be called out for what they are. You killed Christ. You are doing what is evil. That is not right. That is wrong. Stop doing that. Repent of that and accept uh, the, uh, salvation. Uh, that was always Christ's message, is, is, is preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins. When all you preach is one side of that, when all you preach is forgiveness of sins without repentance, you're, you're not doing what Jesus asked. And it, it's, it's likely that, you know, a person who preaches that ha hasn't done that themselves. They have not repented. They've just accepted it. Oh, Jesus loves me no matter what I do. And therefore, they never change. They never change their behavior. They, they never change their ways. And that's what happens. Uh, anytime, if you preached uh, repentance and that was it, repentance without forgiveness, you get the other side of the coin. This hard, cold religion that doesn't save anybody because everybody's just sitting around feeling miserable. Um, but likewise, if all you preach is forgiveness, forgiveness and no repentance, uh, you get this, this weak, limp-wristed church that we have today. Uh, it ha you have to preach both. You have to preach uh, the truth from all angles. Um, and, and a person who's accepted that sting of conscience is not afraid of stinging the consciences of other people because he knows, look, it's good. It's good for you to feel that. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good, but it is good. When you get to the other side, you realize, thank you. Thank you for telling me what I've done. Thank you for pointing out my faults, not out of um, uh, self-righteousness, not of this, this pharisaical, hypo hypocritical thing. No, just preaching the truth. A, a virtuous man loves virtue. He loves goodness, and he loves it in himself, and he loves it in other people. And humility and repentance and, and weeping for our sins is good, and I want you to have that. I want you to weep for your sins. But in order to do that, you have to know how bad it is. How bad is it? You crucified the Savior. That's how bad it is, right? Mortal sin crucifies Christ. All of us, we're all guilty. We have the blood of Christ in our hands. Um, so th th this is the honesty of St. Peter, right? And we're seeing that. We're seeing that the, the putting of these two, the epistle and the gospel together, is giving us that lesson. When you admit as what St. Peter did, when you come face to face with your betrayal uh, and, and you accept it, you accept forgiveness, now you can bring that same forgiveness to other people. So if we, if we keep going um, in, in, in this chapter, Christ asks Peter, uh, he's, he's, we, we should go back to John chapter uh, 13, and we're going to see uh, at between 21 and 13 uh, some parallels. And that is uh, John 13, verse 34, where Christ says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You should also love each other. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, for he, if you have love for one another, as I loved you. And when Christ asked Peter, do you love me? Uh, the word it being used in Greek is agape. Uh, and Peter responds, Christ says, uh, John, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? It's this total, complete, absolute love of charity. And, and in Greek, Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I phylos you. I love you. Phylos is like brotherly love. It's kind of a human love. Uh, Christ wants a supernatural love. Uh, Simon, son of John, do you, love, do you agape me? And Peter says, yes, I phylos you, I love you. Uh, so that there, you, in the Greek, you, we don't get it in English. There's only one word for love. But in the Greek, you see that interplay between the two kinds of love. And um, Christ and St. Peter weren't speaking Greek to each other, but this is the way of the, um, the evangelist, St. John, uh, indicating to us something. In, in, the, in the words he's using, this is what was going on. 
Christ is asking St. Peter, love me as I have loved you, right? Love each other as I have loved you. Not with a human love, uh, uh, phylos, but a, a, a divine love, agape. And following in John chapter 13, Simon Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answers, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answers, will you lay down your life for me? Amen, amen, I say unto thee, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Boom. I mean, right there, a, a um, uh, reference to what is being um, repaired right here in this section. And now uh, Christ says to St. Peter, uh, feed my sheep the third time. Amen, amen, I say unto thee that when you were younger, you used to fasten your belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. So Christ is, is now giving to Peter, now you can follow me. I have died, I have been crucified, and you will follow me. And indeed, St. Peter is. St. Peter is crucified, just like our Lord, although he requests upside down to be crucified, not, uh, not wanting to um, be crucified in the same manner of our Lord. The, the dignity was too great. So this, this, was, this was the third time that Christ appeared to the apostles. Uh, completeness. Three times, uh, for, uh, for each, one for each of the Trinity. Uh, they have what they needed. Uh, the next time Christ appears to his apostles will be the Ascension, and after that, Pentecost, uh, fearless preaching based on humility and forgiveness. Now, as we continue with the readings this week, we're going to see uh, more of, we can see the instruction of Christ, the apostles, some of the imagery, some of the explanations of Scripture, uh, some more of the considerations of what goes into uh, an apostle, right? What, what should be the, the, what was the mind of the apostles? What was going on? Like, how did this all start? How, how, did, how were the first evangelists formed? Uh, how were they taught by Christ? And how did they go out and preach? What, what are some of the principles uh, for us? When we go out and preach, when we are all also called to be apostles, uh, what should be in our minds, right? What's our foundation and formation? So the, the, um, that's what this week is. This Easter week is kind of setting for us in the church. How should we be apostles to others? Uh, and so uh, I think one, uh, a great, great lesson, one of the greatest lessons from today is just that. Uh, be humble, admit our weaknesses, admit we have betrayed Christ, accept his forgiveness, and now we can go out and preach that full message to others. Repent, you have sinned. Yes, you have problems. You, you have betrayed our Lord. Uh, this is a hard truth. Uh, here's evil, here's good. Stop the evil, begin doing good, and, and be forgiven. Repent. Uh, that needs to be that full message. Let us not be afraid of that or, or timid in that, uh, but boldly proclaim, proclaim it. Uh, the net of the church is unbroken. There's only one church, there's only one salvation, Christ our Lord, and it's a mercy to preach that to people. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.